I think this club should start full time. We want to go full time, we think that's the next step. There is going to be turbulence, there is going to be pain, there is going to be disruption in the changing room. If I was a German, I would sack us. We're in big trouble. Cowards! There will be people who will fall away through professionalism. Yes, good morning and welcome to the Peninsula Stadium where, as you can see, I'm joined by Paul Scholes, Ryan Giggs and Gary Neville. Good morning, gentlemen. How are we? Very good, thank you. Gary, you're looking a little, shall we say, Christmas, pa Christmas party last night. <laughs> so it's not just a glum face because of Manchester United's <laughs> result last night? No, we heard the result when we were out. Scholes, you watched it, didn't you? Me and Giggs were out. I did, Gary, yeah. How was it? Um, I got beat. <laughs> Yeah, they'd, look, time of season, um, probably looked a little bit tired. I know they were playing players that probably haven't played as, as many games, but there's still quite a few, a few who had. Um, looked a bit leggy, looked a little, little bit lifeless, to be honest with you, but you have to give credit to Bristol City. They were... <laughs> no, Bristol City were very good, played some really good football and deserved a win. Now, what is looking very sharp is this place. I was here a couple of seasons ago and it's transformed, really, out of recognition. What's it been like, the journey? You've been in charge now for three years, two promotions, and obviously it's been well documented with the programme as well. What has that journey been like? It's been brilliant, really. I mean, I, I, in terms of the ground, um, there's different ways of doing it. I think that we were, some clubs were really good to us when we first set off, so we went and tr we travelled to Fleetwood, to Morecambe, to Fylde, uh, to Wimbledon. Clubs have been on that journey, you'd sort of come up through the leagues, and they said, one of the, every one of them said, uh, you know, consistently, Make sure you do your ground all at once. Don't do it sort of bit by bit. So don't become compliant bit by bit, piece by piece, because it ends up that you're always under construction. You always make mistakes. So do it all at once. So some of the advice that we were given by some of the clubs that obviously the journey we're looking to do, um, the reason that is is it is. You know, we said right, we'll listen to the clubs that have been on this journey, for, let's say, and they were, they were really good with us. Opened everything to us. The, the mistakes they'd made, what they'd done well, um, and we've just tried to follow in basically the footsteps of what these clubs have done previously. What's it been like for you though, Paul, as and not just former teammates, but your close friends as well, to be working together like this? In particular, a lot of the meetings, Gary chairs them. You seem to take a bit of a back seat. What's that like as business partners? Um, it's good. I enjoy it, to be honest with you. It's, um, you know, we have to go to, to a meeting for all of us. It ends up a, a meeting that Gary just wants to talk for two hours. Um, but no, it's interesting. There's, you know, a lot of it you know, goes over my head to be honest. I'm not someone who's interested in the business side of it, the running of the, the club. I just want to come down and watch the football, but it's something Gary and the rest of the lads are, are really good at. How different has it felt, though, to be on the other side? Because now you're making decisions, particularly now that you're full-time, about players' contracts, about players' livelihoods. How has that felt? Because you've been, as I say, on the other side of it. Yeah, it's, it's something different, but some, something we enjoy doing. Um, you know, we, we get a good look at it. Um, every weekend when we come and watch the team, we, 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 you know, we have a, a feeling of what the team needs and what, what the team wants. Managers probably don't always uh, uh, agree with that. Um, but that's something you, you, you have to deal with in the, in the background. We know, you know going full-time was a, a big part of it. It was going to change people, people's lives. It was going to change some of the players' lives who have had jobs and just been training on Tuesday and Thursday night. And you, know, you have to take that into consideration as well. But I think the... The, the biggest thing we did was we sort a youth team out. That was something that, you know, from the, the, the word go, we wanted to do. Two, two, two and a half years down the line, we, we've managed to do that. And, you know, hopefully now we, we can start building the club from, you know, kids that are nine and ten years of age. Right, and I think one of my favourite parts of the documentary, you must be the only person ever to have done this, in a planning permission meeting, trying to get the ground going, yeah. name-dropping Nelson Mandela. Yeah, we were up against it, so I thought <laughs> drop a few names in. <laughs> what, what was the thinking there? <laughs> there was no thinking to it, it just came out. <laughs> I thought we were struggling a little bit, did you, in the yeah. planning, and I just thought, right, I don't know why I said it. I just said it. Well, why not? Well, it obviously helped, because yeah, you got it. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> what is this, though? Is this a community club or is this a business? Um, I don't think you could say it's a business. Well, it is a business, obviously, in the sense that obviously we, we employ people. You know, you, 
you pay money, there's obviously people come through the door and pay money to come and watch, so it is it in that sense, but I think that the big thing for us was that um, th there were 30 to 40 season ticket holds when we first joined the club. Um, they still, um, we meet with them twice a year, they still get um, heavily reduced season tickets and also the 14 committee members who ran this club um, as volunteers are still all at the club doing what they did before. So in that sense, yeah, we've, we've, we've been true to our word on that and it's important and I say it's critical that through this journey it retains that soul from what Salford was before because it is transformed enormously. But, um, you know, the, the, the planning meeting that Ryan talks about, there were obviously a lot of residents locally were unhappy about the ground going up, but now we have meetings with them every single month, the residents groups, um, we open up the club for them to use for their own private meetings. We try wherever possible to include them um, and we're trying to as much as possible connect with the community and, and, and make it a place that obviously improves what happen what's happening around here. But how sustainable is this? Or is it a reflection of you've got very, very wealthy owners and of course you've got Peter Lynn as well, a billionaire. Have you just putting money into it? How realistic is this as a model? Well, I think when Sam Amanda did it at Wimbledon, 20 years ago, 20 odd years ago, he's seen as a philanthropist. Now, if you put money into a football club, you're seen as being greedy. Um, I don't know what's changed. I think just the football perception's changed. I think from our point of view, we could put our money into a lot of different things than this if we wanted to. We could choose to put our money into various different projects or businesses or sports things. We've chosen to put it into this football club. I don't see the criticism of that. I, I don't get it. You know, the idea people say oh, it's not non league. Well, the idea that OK, the, the clubs that are at the top of the Premier League just stay there and nobody ever tries to come up from behind is ridiculous. That's what sort of has made football fantastic over the last 150 years in this country, that there have been great stories. So from our point of view, we see it as building a club up from sort of what would be very, very... Um, the, the very bottom of, if you like, the English Football League um, and trying to get it up into, obviously, the Football League um, and different parts. So we don't see, I don't see the negative of it. That's why the youth team is so important, you know, because we want to bring, we want to build an academy and we'll need players from our own academy to come through to the first team to be, for it to be sustainable. You know, you can't just keep buying players in, bringing players in. We want players of our own. Did you have concerns, though, that Manchester already has a whole number of clubs around here that you, you, you've got such a large catchment area and so many clubs as well? Does that make it more difficult? Yeah, I suppose it does, but on the other hand, it can help you as well because we can, you know, we can take young players from hopefully you know, United Cities, there's you know, the Oldham, Rochdale, Barry, there's a lot of young players who get disappointed at 16 years of age who get released and um, you know, we, we hope we can give them another chance, which we've, we've already done with the, this year's youth team. You now we've got players from Burnley, we've got players from Oldham. They've all come in and, and, and done really well at 16 years of age. You never know if you're going to be a footballer. There's on probably the odd one who's, who's special, but there's still time. There's, you know, there's plenty of time for players to grow, and hopefully we can do that. Can we compete with them? You know, with, with supporters, probably be difficult, but that's something we have to build up in, in years to come. What's the aim? What's the ultimate aim? To get to the Football League. Um, championship, possibly. Who knows? Um, we know that's a long way off. It's how, how long away? Have you got a plan? Do <laughs> yeah. Um, how many years away to championship? Five years. <laughs> you have to get promoted every year. Look, it's, that, that's not going to happen. We're, we're realistic. We're not. We're not stupid enough to to think we can do that. We've had a good couple of years. Um, we're in a great position this year. Next year again, we're very difficult. There's so many, you know, ex league clubs in in the league above in the in the conference next year. We'll be all be trying to do the same thing. But you know, once we get in that league, we we feel we'll. We'll give it a good go again, we'll, we'll, we'll get new players and you know, hopefully be competing in years to come in the Football League. What's the next big challenge you face, Ryan, in that effort to go up the pyramid? Well, getting promoted this year, that's, you know, as footballers, you, you never look too far ahead. You have to, obviously, especially with being owners, you have to plan. But the, the aim is to be promoted this year. We're in a good position, but... You're you top can't, at the moment, you can, aren't you? We're top, yeah. But, Anything can change, you know, you can get a few injuries. Anything could happen. So that's the, that's the first aim, to get promoted this year. Did you ever think about perhaps starting higher up? There's plenty of clubs yeah. around here. I mean, there's former league clubs that are in the same division as you. Did you not think about starting perhaps with a bigger club? Or was there something about Salford? No, we actually discussed at the time, obviously Scholes is, say, from Oldham, I'm from Bury. 
Um, you could look at sort of clubs of say that ilk. I'm not saying they're available to, to sort of go into, but you know you could look at those clubs and probably actually in sort of getting a lot higher up, probably even you know for less money than we've probably put into this. But I think in terms of everything that we do, we try and do it on, uh, to, towards something that means something to us. And the idea of sort of trying to shape a club in sort of our name and our feeling was th th that was the th that was the great thing about this club, obviously because it was starting from tier eight, but also the fact that Salford had meant quite a lot to us during our lives. You know, Scalzi was born in Salford, Giggs has lived here for forty odd years, uh, and from my Phil and Nicky's point of view, we'd come down, we'd been coming down here to Salford to the Cliff Training Ground and Littleton Road, just down the road here since we were 10, 11 years of age. You know, training with United, so Salford was something that really sort of meant something to us, and obviously just saw the potential and. Um, it, you know, I say it was authentic. We felt, and that was that was important to us. How big a step was going full time? What what difference is it? Obviously, you've got to pay the players more money, but what difference does it make when we, a club? It was it was driven by one the stadium that we needed to do. So we have a stadium like this. You sort of have to professionalise. But secondly, the two clubs that went that finished first and second last season were filed in Kidderminster, and they were full time. So we felt as though to actually try and compete. We had to try and obviously be where the previous clubs that had sort of been successful were. So it was just two things, the stadium development and also the fact that ultimately the clubs that were at the top of our league were full time and we finished fourth last year. Uh, we fourth, yeah, fourth last year. And they, they, they were obviously well ahead of us in terms of points because they were trained every single day. I mean, it's a cracking story, but also, as you know from your professional playing days, success also brings envy. What sort of resistance have you encountered? Um, yeah, I mean, we had the, the planning issue like you just touched on. Um, and you do get a bit of jealousy in football, but that's something we're used to. You know, we've been in the industry long enough. We just feel we're doing things right um, as best we can. Yeah, of course, you're going to make mistakes along the way. But no, I think it is a good story. I think, um, you know, to build a club from Tier 8 and try and get them into the Football League is, you know, is not done every, every day. So. It's something that we believe in, um, building a club, not only from the top, but also from the bottom, like I keep saying about you know, getting a new training ground, getting an academy, and having our own players, which um, you know, eventually when that happens, that'll be brilliant. In a funny way, is it almost echoed some of the accusations that have been thrown at Manchester City that they've bought their way to the top because you've spent the most money coming through the leagues as well? Have you almost faced similar accusations on a different scale? Yeah. Oh, of course we have. I mean. To be fair, what I'll say is that we, we bid for two players two weeks ago and clubs look at it as though, we bid for a player and clubs look at it as if we're being sort of like aggressive, you know, people they, they don't want to do business with us really um, and we're finding that at this stage of time, we find it very difficult actually for clubs to actually want to do things with us at our, around our level um, and you're right, I mean, the reason that you sort of have to invest is that we need to get, for the academy to really become sort of fruitful, we have to get to a high level because you're competing with all the academies in, there's 20 clubs in within an hour of this of Salford. They're all competing for the same young players. We need to get into that point whereby we can compete for those young players with them. Um, not saying United or City, but the other clubs sort of in that sort of area, like Bury, Wigan, Blackburn, Burnley, um, Rochdale, Oldham, um, Macclesfield, all these types of clubs that have sort of got youth teams. We want our youth team to be as successful as possible, but if you're in sort of step eight, step seven, you're never really going to be able to compete. So we have to invest to get to where we need to be in terms of the aspirations of playing at a higher level and also to be able to get the youth team players that we want to come into the club. Good stuff. We've got lots more to ask you, well, all three of you, in fact. So make sure you join us after the break. We'll be discussing Class of 92 full-time even more.
Welcome back to Salford, as Gary just finishes his sandwich. <laughs> you feel better for that bacon roll? <laughs> yeah, I'm good. <laughs> um, a bit of overnight news, Ryan. I'll come to you first of all. Swansea City have parted company with Paul Clement. You're looking for a job. Is that one you'd, you'd be interested in? <laughs> I'm looking for a job. <laughs> You've made it clear you'd like to be involved in management. Is that a club yeah. that would interest you? No. Why not? Um, I've, already, I've spoke to them before. Um, last time before they appointed, um, was it before? Bob Bradley. So, no. Why do you think it's gone wrong, the model at Swansea? Um, Didn't appoint him. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not within the club, but obviously, um, over the years, really well-run club, um, play the right way, and an established Premier League team, but it's tough now. I mean, you see the teams down there, it's tough. It's, it's getting tougher and tougher each year. Um, I mean, they've lost, they lost good players, didn't they? They lost Sigurdsson, they lost Lorente. Cork. Yeah, and probably never replaced them. So um, that's always a problem. Obviously, you need good players. What about management here, Paul, in terms of what it's like for you boys, again, always being on the other side, with your two managers, who are quite characters themselves, the decision to make them full-time and judging whether or not they are the right duo to take you through the leagues? Um, well, they are right because you know, they've got us up the last couple of years. There was, uh, I think, going full time. There was, there was no way you could get rid of them for what they what they'd done for us, um, <coughs> and they're proving again this year that they're doing doing all the right things. Um, you know, top of the league, as, uh, as we say, um, they do it their own way. I don't think we had too much involvement with them really. Um, we don't need to run the end of the phone if they want to speak to us, but they're very much their own people. They've they have their own ideas on players and, uh, and the way they want to play and you know, you, you can't complain with the way they're going at the minute. Of course we wish them every success and hope they stay with you as long as possible, but could there be a scenario if you're a football league club, maybe in a championship, where either of you two are the manager here, reporting to the board? Not for me, no. <laughs> Work for him, no chance. <laughs> not a chance. Is, is, that not a, is that not a possibility? Somebody has to start Bernard and Johnny as well. We're not, we're not uh, sure who's going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think they'll, I think they'll be here for I think they'll be here for uh, a while because my view is that they're doing really well, um, and we what we believe in sort of longevity of managers. We do believe in that, and they've been here now for three years. Yeah, three, years. three years, so two promotions. Yeah, two, yeah. two promotions. Last year we didn't get promoted, but I think they, did, they still got the maximum out of the squad that we yeah. we gave them. It's, I think it's, I think we take responsibility for giving them the players, you know, supporting them and getting the players. If we don't get the players for them, which we didn't do the beginning of last season when we didn't go up, then we take that as a failure ourselves rather than saying the managers didn't get us up last year. It was a big challenge for them going full time as well this year because they've never done that. You know, they'd only train Tuesday, Thursday, play the games, sometimes play midweek, and it's completely different when you've got to plan the week. Um, so it was a big challenge for, for them this year. But obviously, they're doing well. One other thing I wondered as well when you first came here, Ramshackle ground, 1,200 maximum, small crowds on a weekly basis, you say 40 support maximum. About 50. <laughs> 40 season ticket holders, and that's what you fell in love with. As you've invested your time, your money, your expertise, it's changed completely. Mm. So is it no longer the thing that you loved? Or is the journey? No, there is a bit of that. Because and Andy Pilly at uh, Fleetwood said to us that the best years he had uh, with Fleetwood were the very first years when he used to go to the grounds, stand on the bankings on the side of the pitch. And he's right, I think. Well, it was about here, wasn't it? It was. was. Ledge. Yeah. yeah. We, we still, we still uh, sit and stand here now on match days to watch in the same position. Um, and. There were really good times then when you think about it, you know, just having a laugh, watching the, watching the team, it was, it was brilliant. That, that is a loss, it is a loss, there's no doubt about that. OK, let's broaden it slightly now, in terms of the league table itself. I know you've had a late night, so you may not want to talk about this, but is there any stopping Manchester City right now? Very difficult. I think the United, my, my own view was that United had to damage them um, a couple of weeks ago. And not only did they not damage them, they actually came out of Old Trafford even more confident than they came in, and that, that's a problem. It'll be difficult to stop. You can see that wave of the celebrations at the end of the game. I noticed it at Huddersfield before the United game that they are over celebrating, and that's not a criticism, but when you have that wave of celebration and that wave of spirit, you can feel that it's going to be very difficult to stop. That's something I'm not sure what it would be that could stop them, to be honest with you. You won the treble as players. Is it premature to talk about Manchester City emulating that? They're even talking about the quadruple. 
Um, no, it's, I mean, you see it when we did it. You, you had a lot of luck along the way. Um, we had a we had a brilliant squad. Not only a brilliant team. Have City got that type of squad? I'm not too sure if they have. Um, but obviously, the starting 11, 12, 13 players are very, very good, and they're on fire at the moment. But it's very difficult to do to win cup games. You know, it's um, anything could happen because you've got to change the team. You know, you've seen with the way they changed it at Leicester. You know, one on penalties. It's very difficult, but. You have to say at the moment that they're on fire, but it's a long season. And especially at this Christmas period, if you come out of it um, unscathed, then, then obviously they'll have a good chance. Are they playing the most exciting football you've ever seen in the Premier League, Manchester City? Mm -hmm. um, difficult to say. We, obviously, we was involved in teams that played very exciting football. Um, you have to say what they're doing now is, is special. I, th I think we all thought at the start of the season that they would play without doubt the best football is whether they could keep it tight at the back and they've, they've, they've managed to do that, um, which, is a, which has been a problem for everybody else. You have to think the only thing that may, may stop them is, is injuries to the, to the key players. Um, you know, David Silva, De Bruyne, these type of people, Sane, have been fantastic. Can they go a full season without having a, a spell of six or seven weeks out? And how can they cope with that at the time when it comes? Um, but on the other hand as well, the, the teams who are in around them have to win their games. They have to show that when City aren't at the best that these, these teams can step up? Well, so far we haven't seen City not at their best. How difficult will the motivation be for the other teams? Jurgen Klopp said the other day, look, we're just playing for second. We, we, they're so far ahead, we've got to forget about them. How tough is that to go out and do? Well, there is an acceptance, it would seem, from you know, a few of the other managers. I think um, Conte said something similar in a couple of weeks ago as well, that they can't catch Manchester City. I mean, what they've done, they would be the top of the league in any season of the Premier League history with doing what they're doing. You know, they've drawn one game and won every single other game. I mean, that's, it's unprecedented. So they would always be five, six, seven, eight points clear probably in any season. So the other teams shouldn't be too hard upon themselves. It is pretty special what we're seeing at the moment. Well, you're nine points clear, the top of Van Arma National League North. At what point are you home and host? It's mathematically possible, <laughs> but, or impossible to be caught. So you're taking nothing for granted? Nothing for granted. No. I think we're eight points at the minute, but we're the team is second ever game in hand, so yeah. OK, well, we're certainly not taking you for granted and this fabulous story. Gary, Ryan, Paul, thank you very much indeed for your time. Don't forget to watch The Class of 92, full-time, available on demand, episode three, this Sunday night at 10 o'clock. Thank you very much.